You know, I love living in the suburbs because it gives me the convenience of being near a city, but it also gives me that quiet, creative space, which really helps me do my work. Hi, I'm Tom Salta, and this is my studio. Come on in. So this is my workstation. I've always been an avid fan of the Mini Moog, so I have to have one of those. It's just the ultimate in bass sounds. I have a, a Prophet here. The Arturia Drum Group. This is a cool little thing. It's just got some nasty tones. It's so retro. And then the monster over here is the Arturia Matrix Brute. This thing really can do some amazing. amazing. Back here, I just have my keyboard wall. This is a collection of many of the synths that I had over the years, starting with the first one I ever owned from 1985 was the JX3P. Um, another one of my favorite memories was the first time I ever played a keyboard. Uh, it was at a friend's house, probably in 1984, and it was the Juno 106. When I heard a key pressed and it wasn't a piano sound, because that's what I grew up with, I was just completely amazed. And uh, this Juno 106 uh, supposedly belonged to the Pet Shop Boys, which is kind of cool. I've been in the music business since 1989, and the um, first 15 years of my career were spent mainly on making records, producing, songwriting, things like that. I've always loved video games from when I was a little kid back in the, back in the late 70s. So music and video games have always been a parallel passion of my life. In 2001, when the music industry started changing and video games really started exploding, I began playing games like Halo and Rainbow Six and Prince of Persia. And that's really when I fell in love with video game music and thought that this is where my career needs to go. I really had to figure out how am I going to start over in so many ways. I have experience making records and producing and songwriting. I know how to do all of that, but it was a brand new uh, side of things. So I came up with the idea to come up with a solo album uh, and become an artist. So that's where I created Atlas Plug and that enabled me to introduce myself into a brand new side of the industry and getting my music licensed in video games, and film, and TV. One of the first video games that I got music in was Rally Sport Challenge 2. And then that led to music in Crackdown. And then I began to score games like Need for Speed Underground 2, Prince of Persia, Ghost Recon, Advanced Warfighter, and many of those other games. A decade later, I had a chance to work on one of my dream games, which was Halo. So when I begin working on a video game, I'm often given a brief by the client, the developer, the audio director, and uh, he or she will always explain to me what the, um, what the game is about, if I'm not already familiar with it, and the aesthetic they want to create, what the music is going to be communicating to the player. So in the case of Wolfenstein Youngblood, it was really fun. The idea of this was that it took place in 1980, 1981. The audio director wanted the music to support this post-apocalyptic, neo-punk, post-punk era, uh, like Cocteau Twins and, and very oozing, swelling, bendy, reverberant, ambient, dark, dystopian feeling. And so that's perfect. I love that. I love all that kind of stuff. So Arturia was hugely instrumental in helping me create those tones and textures and instruments. Being able to use some of the, the gear that uh, I always dreamed about owning when I was starting out with synthesizers like the Yamaha CS80, and, and of course the, the famous Clavier and the Fairchild and the Prophets, and really allowed me to be like a kid in a candy store and uh, have access to all of this gear and multiple versions of it too. I could, didn't have just one synth club, I could have like five of them. 
Okay, so why don't we just dig right in and I'll show you how I used Arturia plugins on my recent score for Wolfenstein Youngblood. It was really a dream come true because this whole score was to take place in the game in the early 80s, specifically I think 1980-81. And um, this is was a dream come true uh, with Arturia because I got to use all my favorite vintage synth plugins uh, like uh, the... ARP 2600, which actually came out in the 70s, but it was used in the 80s. And then the CS80, which most people know from hearing it on Vangelis' amazing scores of like Blade Runner and Chariots of Fire. Um, so in this cue, for example, just the atmosphere I was able to get with some of these um, plugins was really perfect. So let's say, just using this as one of the patches. And I just love how it evolves and just the mood it evokes. And this is pretty much the raw sound plus a little bit of reverb on it. All right. So that's there, but you know, then you call up something like the, the, the CS80. Uh, it's just amazing. So. It's just like bleeding 80s or this kind of stuff. I mean, it's unmistakable what era that is. So here's an example of just some of the moods that I was able to create based on the foundation of the uh, Turia plugins, like the ARP 2600 and the CS80. You know, it's just like so gritty and dirty and just oozes that kind of, yeah. So that would be an example of an area where nothing's really happening. It's just more about establishing the atmosphere. This is an example of an area where you might be detected by the enemy and they're looking for you. So there's more tension. that pulsing sound. This is an Arturia plug-in from the CS80. You know, to me that just feels so very early 80s, even late 70s, but that was such a authentic worm sound. It does not feel in any way digital to me whatsoever. Here's another piece from uh, Wolfenstein Youngblood, and uh, this one allowed me to use one of my dream pieces of gear that I would have never been able to afford, and I probably still can't afford it, is the, uh, the Synclavier. So that was the, this thing would range $100,000, $200,000, $300,000, depending on the configuration. Uh, back in the 80s. Having the ability to have a synclavier, or rather multiple synclaviers, was literally a, a dream come true for me, and the sounds are so legit. And it just screams early 80s retro. So. the whole foundation of the vibe on this. Here's 
that base. So really, it's like I'm a kid in a, in a candy store here with all these early 80s synths and having the excuse to use them all, especially in one score is just, come on, it doesn't get any better than that. But especially like the CS80, it's like instant score. just puts you in that space. I like consistency when I'm building music for a particular area in a video game, even though I'm scoring in smaller musical segments like musical Lego blocks that get connected in various ways, I like having some cohesiveness. So I really wanted this one to have a lot of consistency with Synclavs and, and CS80s, the Yamaha CS80s. So, um, you can hear it here, even when I'm starting in the, the, the lowest intensity. atmosphere you know and then uh, when it gets heavy they can still cut through so let me show you some of the ways that I got the Synclav to get really aggressive it's not just her atmosphere I used from the sync cloud. It's just nasty. You know, it just feels. I think it's perfect for Wolvenstein because it has that kind of metallic, high tech, but yet raw and, and rusty and dark. And that was it. I was trying to limit myself to the technology that would have been available in 1980 and then use the plug-in, since I don't have all of that gear, to find the, uh, the right palette. And then one of my newest toys is the Matrix Brute. This was a lot of fun to use on the, on the project. What I love about this thing is it gives me the ability to have the power of a modular synth system, but also have the speed of instant recall and I can experiment on different patches at once. You know, with a real true modular system, you have all these wires and once you move it, you'll never find that patch again. With this, I can save it. And also it's got all the options on the, on the back panel. So I have all the CV controls and what have you. But so in any case, you know, just turning knobs and having the serendipitous kind of experimentation going on allows me to come up with sounds I would never would have thought of.
Here's another one I really like playing around with. video games my entire life and uh, nothing beats my memories of going to the arcade every week you know playing some of these very games so I've been collecting these for a while now um, I remember one of my fondest memories was when Dragon's Lair came out in 1983 I was completely blown away so much so I was so obsessed with this game in the arcade that uh, I grabbed some magic markers and a, and a white t-shirt and I made my own t-shirt of Dragon's Lair and my dream was that one day, my god, wouldn't it be incredible to have that in your house, you know? So, um, so several years ago, my dream came true. I had a custom uh, arcade machine uh, designed for me called The Dream Machine and uh, it literally has over 80,000 games in it, including, of course, Dragon Slayer. So, so if there's any doubt that I play the games that I do music for, uh, doubt no more. This is uh, this is Wolfenstein Cyber Pilot, which is a VR game that I also contributed uh, music for, and uh, it's a blast. I'm playing it right now on the Vive, and uh, wow, this is scary. I'm like really high up, going up a big elevator. Man, this is so cool. I think I would have had a heart attack if I was 10 years old and this technology kind of came out. This is unbelievable. It's like literally a dream come true. You're in the game. For me, it's like a museum of my life. It's a, it's a video game museum so I can go back and play any of the old, old arcade games or console games or what have you. So uh, it's just a, it's a fun hobby one. 